Welcome to Steps to Life. Ask the beasts, and they will teach you, and the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you, and the fish of the sea will explain to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? Every day we are all faced with decisions concerning buying or selling or various worldly business. We have been told that as long as we are in this world, we will have to conduct worldly business. That statement in the Spirit of Prophecy has been a mystery to me for many years because I have always asked myself the question, how can you conduct worldly business if you couldn't buy or sell? But that statement is there. And we, the amount that we are willing to invest in time or money or pay for something depends upon our estimation, and it's always an estimate, our estimation of that thing's worth. And one of the great tragedies of our world today is that 
we human beings seem to be unable to make a correct estimate of the worth of different things. If you're involved in any kind of commerce, buying or selling, I'm sure that you have noticed that the buyer is always interested in getting the best price. A man down here in Arkansas by the name of Sam Walton became a billionaire working on that principle, telling people, we'll sell it to you for less. And in all of life, we make estimates concerning the value, the value of a car that we want to purchase, the value of a home that we would like to purchase, or the value of an education that we would like to acquire, or the value of something that we want to, to sell to somebody else. We try to place value on things, and the seller is always trying to to place the highest value on it, and the buyer is always trying to place the lowest value on it, and that leads to what we call bargaining or on the stock market they call it the bid-ask spread. And uh, one is the price that a wholesaler, a dealer, an agent wants to sell for, and the other is the price that he wants to buy for. And so the bid price is what he will pay. It's always lower, always. Sometimes only by one penny, but it's always lower. And so in every field of endeavor, we try to place values on things. And like I say, our great tragedy is that the thing that's worth more than anything else, we don't place the proper value on it, and therefore we don't exert ourselves to acquire it. I want to read to you a statement that I have pondered for many years since I first read it. it you know when you read a book sometimes uh, there's, there's a statement that will just jump out at you and this is a book that I read called Confrontation. It's a compilation of Ellen White writings about the temptations of Jesus. And in this book there is a description of what she says that Satan knew that you and I don't know. Now there are a lot of things that the devil knows that you and I do not know. And one of the things that he understands very well that we don't know is how valuable heaven is. Did you know that the devil understands that a lot better than you do? A lot better than I do? And the reason is that he has been there and he has experienced what heaven is like and he knows what it's like and he knows what it's worth. And, and you and I, we hope to go there, but we haven't been there yet. We have not experienced what it is like to be there. And so one of our great dangers, even as Christians, is that we won't place the proper estimate on its value. I've been reading this past week and some accounts, maybe at our preaching revival this evening, I'll tell you one or two, not now. Accounts of the experiences of Christians that lived in past generations when it costs something, often your life, to be a Christian. But people still became Christians by the millions because of the value that they placed on eternal life. Now this is what Ellen White says that the devil knew that you and I don't know. I hope that the Holy Spirit will impress this upon your mind because I'm powerless to help you understand the significance of what I'm going to read to you unless the Holy Spirit opens the eyes of your understanding so that you understand it. So before I read it, would you just bow your heads and I want to pray with you. Father in heaven, 
I pray that you will forgive us for our gross misestimation of which things are worth more and what we are willing to do, what we are willing to pay for various things. Help us that we may become unconfused com concerning the comparative value of everything in this world and the value of things that we cannot see as yet. Help us to understand now what we read and to make application of it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is what she says about the devil. This was in, in the wilderness of temptation, when Jesus was in the wilderness of temptation. She says, Satan was well acquainted with the position of honor Christ had held in heaven as the Son of God, the beloved of the Father, and that he should leave heaven and come to this world as a man filled him with apprehension for his safety. He could not comprehend the mystery of this great sacrifice for the benefit of fallen man. <clears throat> he knew that the value of heaven far exceeded the anticipation and appreciation of fallen man. How valuable is it? Well, it's much more valuable than we anticipate or we can appreciate. Far more valuable than that. How valuable is it? This is what the devil knows. It says, the most costly treasures of the world, he knew, would not compare with its worth. The most costly treasures of this world would not compare with its worth. The devil knew that because he'd been there. He'd experienced it. And then she writes, as he had lost through his rebellion all the riches and pure glories of heaven, he was determined to be revenged by causing as many as he could to undervalue heaven and to place their affections upon earthly treasures. It was incomprehensible to the selfish soul of Satan that there could exist benevolence and love for the deceived race so great as to induce the prince of heaven to leave his home and come to a world marred with sin and seared with a curse. He had knowledge of the inestimable value of eternal riches that man had not. Notice, Satan knew what you and I don't know. He knew that these riches were so great, they were so valuable, that you could not place an estimate on how much they were worth. He knew that. Then she writes, He had experienced the pure contentment, the peace, exalted holiness, and unalloyed joys of the heavenly abode. He had realized before his rebellion the satisfaction of the full approval of God. He had once a full appreciation of the glory that enshrouded the Father and knew that there was no limit to his power. Satan knew what he had lost. Now, friends, the, the great tragedy is that if you lose eternal life, someday you're going to realize what you've lost. You know why? Because at the end of the millennium, when the holy city comes down here that you can read about in Revelation 20 and 21, when the holy city comes down here, the wicked are going to see it. Now, they're not going to see it from the inside, but they will see it from the outside. But just looking at it from the outside, do you know what Ellen White says about that city? She says, if you could get one glimpse of that city, you would never want anything in this world again. She says that. I can't explain that. I haven't seen it. But if you could get one glimpse of it, you'd never want anything in this world again. And they're going to see it. And Ellen White describes this in the book Great Controversy. How that they have this craving, this longing to have eternal life. But it's too late. Now, friend, 
it'll be too late then. But right now, it's not too late for you. Right now, you can make a decision so that you could have eternal life. I can't, I can't explain to you what the devil knows that you and I don't understand. Jesus, we read it in our scripture, he attempted to make as plain as possible for human beings to understand that if you could get how much of the world? What did Jesus say in our scripture in Mark 8? If you could get the whole world, would it be worth exchanging the whole world for your soul? Would it? No. What advantage would the whole world be when you die? Or maybe you won't die. Maybe you'll live until Jesus comes. What good will everything in this world do you when Jesus comes? How much good will the real estate do you? Or the money or the gold or the silver. The Bible says in Ezekiel 7, they'll take their gold and their silver and they'll throw it in the street because it's See, gold and silver is just a medium of exchange. That's all it is. When the Lord comes, it won't be worth anything to have gold and silver. So, the most important question that you can ask is, how can I live so that I can receive the gift of eternal life? That's the most important question that a human being can ask. So, I want to review this question with you for a few minutes today. How do I have to live? How can I inherit eternal life? What do I have to do so that I can be saved? Let's open your Bible. First of all, to 1 John 1 and verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive to us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, confession is a very popular activity in our world today. There are hundreds of millions of people that go to church regularly to confess to their priest. And they're trusting that if they confess, everything is going to be all right. Uh, but this is not the only text in the Bible that tells us what we are to do in order to receive salvation. In fact, we need to always remember that there will be people who have gone to confession who will not be saved. Can you think of anybody in the Bible who confessed his sins and was still lost? Thank you. Achan is an excellent example. Did Achan confess explicitly what he had done? Yes, he did. Why was Achan not saved? Let me explain it quickly. Confession doesn't do any good without repentance. I'll say that again. Confession doesn't do any good without repentance. In fact, in the book Steps to Christ, the chapter on confession comes after the chapter on repentance. Many people today read this text about confession and they think that if they confess, then everything will be all right. And that is all is true if they have repented. So let's look at what the Bible says about repentance. So let's, there's many texts in the Bible about repentance. Look first of all at Romans 2.
verse 4. Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Roman, that's Romans 2 4. Here's what Peter said about it in Acts 3, verse 19. He said, Repent, therefore, and be converted. Now, the words that are translated to repent, the words that are translated to be converted, are very, very similar words. The word that's translated repent means to change your mind. And the word that's translated to be converted means to turn around, go in a different direction. And if you change your mind, you're going to start going in a different direction. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Have you ever met somebody that believes that they're all right so that they don't need to repent? And they may tell you, I repented before I was baptized, so I'm okay now. When a person thinks that way, the problem is I'll, I'll, I'm just going to say it to you really bluntly. They have not received the Holy Spirit. And that's the reason they think that way. And let me explain that. As soon as a person receives the Holy Spirit, immediately, when the Holy Spirit illuminates their mind, they know something about themselves that the man on the street that has not received the Holy Spirit doesn't know. Well, what do they know right away? I'm going to read it to you. I won't even put it in my own words. This is the way Ellen White describes it in the book Steps to Christ in the chapter on repentance. She says, We may have flattered ourselves, as did Nicodemus, that our life has been upright, that our moral character is correct, and think that we need not humble the heart before God like the common sinner. There's a lot of Christians today that, just like Nicodemus, don't, that don't think that they're common sinners. But notice what she says next. But when the light from Christ shines into our souls, we shall see how impure we are. If we don't think that we're impure, what does that mean? We haven't received the light yet. We shall see how impure we are. We shall discern the selfishness of motive, the enmity against God that has defiled Every act of life, everything that a person's done is defiled. We are impure, and every act of life is defiled by selfishness. Now, when a person first sees that, it is very often a shocking experience. And preachers, anybody that's in, in evangelism has had this experience often. All of a sudden, a person says to you, there's no hope for me. When a person first sees how bad their heart really is, the, the devil then tempts them to give up hope. You're so bad, you'll never make it. And there's a lot of people that think that they can't become Christians right now because they've got to do something to get themselves shaped up a little bit, cleaned up a little bit, something a little bit better before they can even come to the Lord. And that is a dreadful mistake. Because, friend, I'm not talking about the outside. You can clean the outside of the body. But the Bible's very clear. You can't change your heart. Our heart is naturally impure and selfish. And so, if you realize that, then what are you supposed to do? Here's what to do. 
If you see your sinfulness, do not wait to make yourself better. There is help for us only in God. We must not wait for stronger persuasions, better opportunities, holier tempers. We can do nothing of ourselves. We must come to Christ just as we are. So as soon as I realize how bad I am, the devil tempts me to give up. Instead of giving up, I have to come to the Lord just the way I am. I used to work with an evangelist when I was a young pastor. I used to tell people, I don't know how many times I've heard him tell them, people this in their home. He says, now, he says, when you come to the Lord, all you can give to the Lord is a weak will and a wicked mind and an impure heart. That's all you have. You can't give the Lord anything else than that because that's all you have. But you have to come to him just the way you are. That's what repentance is. It involves coming to the Lord just the way they are. And we're living in a time when preachers are emphasizing God's mercy and love and grace. And that is good to emphasize God's love and mercy and grace. There were times when preachers preferred to, to speak more about hellfire and other doleful subjects rather than the love and mercy and grace of God. So we need to study and understand the love and mercy and grace of God, but we must be careful that we don't ever pervert it. What is happening today in the Christian world is that there are many people that are deceived with the idea that because of God's great love and mercy that he will save even the rejectors of his grace. And so there are the Unitarians that say, well, everybody will be saved eventually. The Bible doesn't teach that. If you do not repent, the Bible teaches that you will not be saved. You'll be lost. Uh, the reason people think that is because, one of the reasons is that they don't understand what the Bible teaches about sin. When I was a young person, over and over again in my mind, I used to ask the question, I don't know if you've asked this question in your mind, I used to ask this question over and over and over. Why did Jesus have to be nailed to a cross? Why did he have to be scourged? Why did he have to go through all these awful things at his trial? Isn't there an easier way to die than that? Why, why, why? I kept asking myself, why? Let me read to you why. Ellen White explains why. She says, The exceeding sinfulness of sin can be estimated only in the light of the cross. When men urge that God is too good to cast off the sinner, let them look to Calvary. It was because there was no other way in which man could be saved. That's why. There wasn't any other way. Because without this sacrifice, it was impossible for the human race to escape from the defiling power of sin and be restored to communion with holy beings. Impossible for them again to become partakers of spiritual life. It was because of this that Christ took upon himself the guilt of the disobedient and suffered in the sinner's stead. The love and suffering and death of the Son of God all testify to the terrible enormity of sin and declare that there is no escape from its power, no hope of the higher life, but through the submission of the soul to Christ. The cross reveals to us that sin is a terrible power and a terrible evil, and that it is an awful thing to attempt to get rid of it, and that is the only way that, I say this reverently, that is the only way that the God of heaven could get rid of it and save you. We have to come to Jesus just the way we are. And remember, all we have to offer is a weak will, a wicked mind, and an impure heart. That's all we have. Don't wait until you have something better to offer because you're not going to have something better to offer. That is all that any of us have, period. Period. 
There are many people who are waiting. They intend to come to Jesus and be saved. Not today, but they intend in the future. This is one of the most dangerous things that you can do. Do you realize, friends, that there have been millions of people who have lost their souls who intended to be saved? I think I won't take time now to tell you stories. I can tell you stories. I know some. I know some that happened to my own relatives. But I'm not here to try to play on your emotions, but I do want you to think. I want you to think about this. If you intend to come to Jesus and say, Lord, I am ready to repent. I'm ready to, I'm ready to surrender to you, to your sovereignty, for you to be the Lord of my life. I'm ready. I'm ready to, to leave my sins. If you are planning to do that sometime, why not do it today? You know, there are people that go to church every week and they're hanging on to some darling sin or sins in their life. And they know that they can't go to heaven with this. And they're intending to repent of this and get rid of it sometime. But they're getting so much pleasure out of it right now. They can't do it. They just feel they can't do it right now. And... Friend, do you realize that there are people that are in this situation and they've been in this situation for years? They're not just 15 or 20 years old anymore. They've been in this situation for 30 or 40 years. But they're not going to heaven like that. They haven't repented of it. You know, you know what repentance means. Repentance means that you're sorry for this because you know that this is what Jesus called cause Jesus to go to the cross, and you're sorry enough, you're willing to quit. That's what the repentance means. If you're not willing to quit, you haven't repented. If there's any sin in your life that you're not willing to quit, you have not repented yet. Not with the repentance that's sufficient so that you can go to the kingdom of heaven. Friends, there's, there are Christians, there are Seventh-day Adventist Christians all over the world who know that if they're going to go to heaven, they're going to have to quit this, whatever their darling sin is. And they plan to. And friends, some of them die and they haven't done it yet. I don't want that to happen to any of you. That's why I'm giving you this appeal. If you know that there's something in your life that you have to repent of in order for you to go to heaven, why not choose to do it today? Why not go to the Lord today and say, Lord, I'm willing, I'm willing to quit now. I've enjoyed this darling sin for however many years it is, but Lord, I, I'm willing to repent of it now, today. Because the Bible says today is the day of salvation. You don't know how many tomorrows you have. You just don't. You don't know how tempted I am to tell you stories along that line, but we'll run out of time if I tell you stories. Here's, what, here's the way Ellen White described it. She said, "Do beware of procrastination. Do not put off the work of forsaking your sins and seeking purity of heart through Jesus. Here is where thousands upon thousands have erred to their eternity eternal loss. In other words, they've lost their soul doing this. I will not here dwell upon the shortness and uncertainty of life, but there is a terrible danger, a danger not sufficiently understood in delaying to yield to the pleading voice of God's Holy Spirit in choosing to live in sin, for such this delay really is. You see, if there's something in my life, and I know that I can't go to heaven with this, but I'm not willing to give it up right now. What I am really deciding to do is to live in sin today.
Well, somebody might say, well, I'm down to one. <laughs> Can you go to heaven if you're down to one? You only have one more sin left to repent of. Can you go to heaven like that? Here's what Ellen White said about that, because there's, there's lots of people that think along these lines. We're so used to our educational system where we get graded on the curve, and so if you get 70%, you got a C, and if you get 80%, you got a B, and if you get 90%, and you got an A, and so people think along those lines, and they figure that I'm almost there. I'm in pretty good shape. This is all in the book Steps to Christ. You can read it in the chapter on repentance. She says, even one wrong trait of character, one sinful desire persistently cherished, will eventually neutralize all the power of the gospel. Would you like all the power of the gospel to be neutralized in your life so it's not powerful anymore? That's what will happen if you cling to some secret darling sin in your life. Turn in your Bible. This is a text Ellen White quotes in this chapter. Turn in your Bible to Proverbs. I started being fearful of this text when I was young. I'm very thankful. When I was still a teenager, I, I found out about this. This is Proverbs, the fifth chapter, and verses 21 and 22. Here's what it says. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. His own iniquities entrap the wicked man, and he is caught in the cords of his sin. He's caught in the cords of his sin. I don't advise any young person to engage in the reading of fiction because it is forbidden in the Word of God. It's forbidden in the Ninth Commandment. And it's forbidden in the Spirit of Prophecy. And I'm sorry to have to say that I did, however, myself read some fiction when I was a young man. And one of the fictitious works that I wrote, the fellow that wrote it was a Christian, and it was supposed to be one of the great fictitious works or writings that was written. It's called Gulliver's Travels. And in this fictitious writing, he talks about being in a place where all the people were little tiny, and he, when he laid down to sleep, these little tiny people, they... Everything they had was miniature, and they, they tied him up so he couldn't get up. And the, the cords that they tied him with were little tiny, like strings, but there were so many of them that he, he was stuck. And friend, that is the way sin is. The one sin that you don't overcome. Eventually, there will be like little strings all around your conscience, your brain, your, your heart, your mind, your will. You'll be tied. Now, not, not any one of those strings. You see, you form habits by thousands of actions. And no one of those habits would break you. But when you put them all together, what does the text say? He is bound. Well, what's he bound by? He's bound by the cords of his sin. Let me tell you some good news. Maybe there's somebody here. Maybe there's more than one person here. As you're thinking about this, you're starting to realize you're already bound. And then I'm not talking about something that's in the future for you. You're already there. And you're, you're bound and you've got something in your life that you can't get free from it. You're bound. Jesus said, he that commits sin is a slave of sin. What does the word slave mean? The Greek word is doulos. That means a bondservant. A slave. What is a slave? A slave is a person that's not free. And the slave doesn't continue in the house forever. He doesn't abide. He doesn't remain in the house forever. If you're bound, if you're living in sin, if you're a slave, 
you will not have everlasting life because Jesus said you will you won't abide in the house forever not not forever but the son remains forever <laughs> if therefore the son will set you free you will truly be free Jesus would like to set you free maybe there's something in your life some mental habit some spiritual habit some habit of speech some habit of eating some habit of drinking some habit of acting and you know that is wrong and you've done it so many thousand times you can't stop but Jesus can set you free and friend Jesus wants to set you free Ellen White says, Christ is ready to set us free from sin, but he does not force the will. He won't force you to be free, but he's ready to set you free. Oh, friend, have you had an experience in being set free? If you ever had an experience of being set free from something that you tried a hundred times and set yourself free and you couldn't and then the Lord sent you free, nobody will ever be able to tell you that God is dead, let me tell you, because you know that God's done something for you. One of my favorite stories about this happened to a man, he's dead now, but <clears throat> both these men are dead now, because it happened a long time ago. But the, the evangelist himself told me this story. He was having evangelistic meetings in a certain town, and there was a man that was coming to the evangelistic meetings every night, and he was accepting everything. He accepted the Sabbath. He understood the state of the dead. He understood that Jesus was coming soon in the clouds of heaven, and he wanted to be ready. They studied all the different doctrines in the Bible. And finally, one of the doctrines that they studied one night, they studied what the Bible says about health. Does the Bible have anything to say about health? The Bible has a lot to say about health. Does the Bible have anything to say about our diet? It has a lot to say about our diet in both the Old and New Testament. And this man that was coming to the meetings was, he came up to the preacher at the end, he, says, he decided he, he couldn't become a Seventh-day Adventist. Well, why? Believed everything. Why? He says, well, he said, I have trouble eating. He said, there is not anything that I can eat but what I will get nausea, get nauseated, I'll vomit it up. He said, there's only one thing I have found that I can eat without having trouble in my stomach. Well, what's that? He said, pork. He said, that's the only thing I can eat. If I eat anything else, anything else, I can't even eat beef. If I eat anything else but pork, I will, I'll just get nauseated. I'll just get sick. And so he said, that's what I live on because that's the only thing I can eat. And now you've read to me from the Bible what the Bible says about eating pork, and I'm stuck, I, 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 so I can't become a Seventh-day Adventist. And this Adventist evangelist that was telling me the story later, that I said to him, would you like a few of the elders of my, of my church and myself to come to your house tonight and have prayer with you and uh, so that the Lord could just deliver you from that so that you won't have that problem anymore? And the man thought about it a moment. He says, well, well yes, yes, I, I, I would like to be able to eat just, just like other people can eat. So he says, all right, they made an appointment that night. Some elders of the church and this man went up to his house and they studied the Bible promises. Now let me ask you this question, friend. If God tells you or me to do something, is God going to make a way so that you and I can do what he says to do? Do you believe that? Do you believe that God would tell you or me to do something and then not give us the power to do it? Do you believe that? Well, they read the Bible promises. And so then they said, we're going to pray. And God is going to deliver you 
Because God has said in his word that you are not to eat pork. That's very plain in Deuteronomy 14 and in Leviticus 11. You are not to eat pork, and so we're going to pray that God will give you the ability to do, to eat something else. And God is going to answer our prayer. He's not going to let you be lost because you are disobedient to his word if you choose to obey. He said, they asked him, do you believe that God can do this? He said, yes, I believe that God can do that. So they said, all right. The elders of the church knelt around him, and they prayed. They prayed that God would deliver him from whatever it was in his digestive system that made it impossible for him to eat nothing but pork. And they promised him, that they said, God is true. God does not tell a lie. God never asks us to do something without giving us the power to do it. And God will answer our prayer. We know that. We don't even have to ask if it's God's will because he's already told us in his book that this is his will for you not to eat pork. And so we know that God is going to answer our prayer. They left. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever been tempted to wonder whether the Lord really was going to answer your prayer? They left. That evangelist didn't sleep very well that night. He said, Lord, we've done everything we can do, but unless you work a miracle in this man's digestive system, there's nothing more we can do. The medical people don't know what's going on. And the next day, when he met that man, this man had a wonderful story to tell. Now this man, remember, this man didn't understand everything that you understand about health reform, all right? All he knew was that he had to quit eating pork. He didn't understand, he didn't understand what you understand about he, eating about eatings and health reform, so don't get angry now at me. This man was, it was bedtime. It was after 10 o'clock at night, almost midnight, in fact. This man was laying there, and he was thinking, these preachers prayed for me, and they told, asked the Lord to deliver me from my physical problem so that I could eat something else besides pork. And they asked me if I believe, and I do believe, and I said, Lord, I believe. I believe that you've already answered my prayer, and I can, I can eat something else. If I can eat something else, I'm going to get up and eat something else. So he got up, and he went down to a store, a fast food place, like a Dairy Queen, and he told them that uh, he wanted a Sunday. And he wanted it with all the fixings, marshmallow, cherries, and nuts, and all the kinds of things that he could never eat. It's almost midnight. And he got this Sunday, and he looked at, he hadn't eaten anything like that for a long time. He said, I'm going to eat it. If, they, if, if, they've, if, they, if, if God has answered their prayer, I can eat this. So he ate the whole thing. And he told the preacher the next day, he said, you know what happened? I ate the whole thing, and I went home, and I laid down in my bed, and I slept like a baby all night. And from then on, he could eat all fruits and vegetables. He, he didn't even have to eat flesh with anything anymore. God delivered him that night. And I want to tell you, friend, I don't know if there's some sin in your life that maybe nobody else even knows about, but I want to tell you God can deliver you today. You don't have to wait until tomorrow, and you do not have to say, if your will be done. You don't have to say that. Because the Lord has told us already that it is his will to deliver you from sin. It's his will. You don't have to pray if it's your will. It is his will. Just ask him. He'll do it. Don't rest, friend, in a supposed hope. A supposed hope will be your ruin. There are a lot of people today that have what Paul talks about would be common in the last days. They would have a form of godliness. And that's all they have. They have a form of religion. A form of godliness. We spent more time on the subject of repentance than anything else because I believe that's the most important. If you understand this, you understand what you need to know. But I want to go over a few other things in the last few minutes that we have left. I want to know, go over a few other things. 
that you and I need to be sure that we understand so that we can receive the gift of eternal life. First of all, I want to say just something very briefly about surrender. And the example in the Bible is this example of Jacob. You remember the story where Jacob fought with somebody by the brook Jabbok and he fought all night long because he thought it was somebody trying to take his life. He thought it was an enemy that was going to kill him. And so he fought with everything he had all night long. He didn't know who he was fighting with. And who was he fighting with? He was fighting with the Lord. Finally, when he recognized who he was fighting with, he, he just grabbed a hold of the Lord. He said, Lord, save me. He surrendered. Here's what Ellen White says about his experience. She says, let no one despair of gaining the victory. Victory is sure when self is surrendered to God. If you surrender yourself to the Lord, you say, Lord, I have this habit. I've tried a hundred times to overcome. The Lord can give you the victory. If you surrender yourself to him, she says, victory is certain. It is absolutely certain. Do not let, here's, an, here's another point. Do not let anybody tell you that as long as your heart is pure, it doesn't matter the way you live. That is one of the devil's lies. The Bible says in Psalm 24, verse 4, that the people that are saved will have a pure heart, but not only a pure heart, what also will they have? They'll have clean hands. The way you live is important. Your, your heart represents what's going on in your thoughts and your feelings and your emotions. Your hands represent what you're saying and doing. If you want to be saved, if you want to inherit eternal life, don't let anybody talk you out of doing what God says to do. Don't let anybody persuade you. You know, there's a story in the Bible about how dangerous this is. It's in 1 Kings 13. You remember that story, the man that went down to Jer Jeroboam and, and told him, and the Lord told him, he says, you're not to either eat or drink in that place until you come back to your own country. And then he was sitting, sitting down on the way back home, and this other prophet came and said, well, the Lord told me the Lord's changed his mind. You can come and eat at my place. So the man went and ate at that man's place, and what happened to him? A lion killed him. Ellen White makes this comment about that story. She says, when the Lord gives a man a command such as he gave this messenger, he himself must countermand the order. Upon those who turn from the voice of God to listen to counter orders, the threatened evil will come. We studied in our Sabbath school today about the overwhelming deception that the devil is going to bring on the world in the last days. And the reason it's going to be so overwhelming is that people will think that it's the Lord telling them that he's changed his mind. How will you know that that is not the Lord? Here's how you can know. Look in Psalm 89. Psalm 89. Verse 34, this is God speaking. He says, my covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. God says, my covenant, the Ten Commandments is his covenant, Deuteronomy 4.13, my covenant, I won't change it. What I have spoken, I won't alter it. What did God speak? He spoke the Ten Commandments. He didn't speak anything else, it says in Deuteronomy. Don't let anybody talk you out of doing what God says to do. Two or three more points quickly. We get as far, far as we can. Do not let the devil get you into a situation where you are not taking time to pray. We live in a very busy world. Preachers have just as much trouble as anybody else. We're so busy, we're in great danger that we will not take sufficient time to pray. There's many examples in the Bible of how 
people back in those days got themselves into terrible trouble because they didn't take time to pray about a situation. You remember the story about Joshua and these people that came? And they said they come from a far country and they wanted to make peace with them. You remember that story? They didn't stop to take time to pray. They got themselves in trouble. You remember the story in the Bible about David, how he got so, he got so worried and so harassed that he decided that he was going to go down to the Philistine, to Achish, and he was going to get refuge there with the enemies of God's people. Ellen White says that he had not taken the time to ask the Lord about this. He just decided he was in so much trouble, he just needed to do this. Have you ever done that? That's when we get in trouble, when we have not taken time to pray about what we're doing. Don't let the devil get you in a situation where you're so busy that you don't take time to pray about your situation. The Bible. We've said this before and it needs to be repeated once in a while. No preacher, no group of preachers, no matter how well they can preach, can preach and teach to you everything that you need to know. You need to be reading the Bible for yourself. Here's what Ellen White said about the Bible. A wonderful, wonderful statement. He said, it is written, the scriptures, is the gospel we are to preach. No flaming sword is placed before this tree of life. All who will may partake of it. There is no power that can prohibit any soul from taking of the fruit of this tree of life. Are you reading your Bible? Well, as I was studying this subject, I noticed a number of different warnings, inspired writings, certain things we need to be careful of so that we do not get gypped. Can I say that word? We do not get gypped from our eternal inheritance. However, we're out of time, so we'll have to look at the warnings another time. Remember this, friend. If there's anything that you need to repent of, don't wait till tomorrow. If there's anything in your life that you know of that needs to come out of your life so that you can go to heaven, do not wait until tomorrow. Go to the Lord today and say, Lord, here it is. Here's my darling sin. Here's my pet habit. Here's whatever it is. I'm willing to repent of this today. And I'm surrendering to you so that you can deliver me from it. And the Lord will hear your prayer. Let's pray before we sing our closing song. Father in heaven, we thank you that a way has been provided so that we can be delivered, so that we can repent and confess our sins and be delivered from the power and guilt of sin. And I earnestly pray for each person here that we may each one experience that liberty that comes when Jesus sets us free from sin. And we pray that he will fulfill his word when he said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And I pray that we might be set free from every defiling lust and habit so that we will be ready for Jesus to come. We pray this in his name and for his sake. Amen. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. Who brings out their host by number? He calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth.